Our first speaker is Ken Quinn. Ken, if you make your way up, please. Ken advocates for, oh, <laughs> Ken advocates for uh, states to exercise their constitutional authority under Article 5 to support an application for the constitutional term limit amendment. Let's all welcome Ken Quinn. I want to thank you, Sam. I want to thank you all for the invite to come here this evening. Oops. Um, wow. This already has really done wonders for my spirit with the beginning prayer and song, and my, my red, white, and blue blood is just pumping right now. So this is great. I got involved in politics back in the, uh, the Tea Party days, so it feels like I'm home. Even though I'm from Maine, uh, I want to thank you for this opportunity for allowing both of us to present our arguments. Now, I want to warn you, um, I'm going to throw a lot of information at you tonight, but that's on purpose. But quickly, before I go into my presentation, just quick poll. Who's in favor of using the Constitution to propose term limits on Congress? Raise your hand. Who is against using the Constitution to propose term limits amendment, or any amendment. Okay, who's kind of on the fence and wants to learn more? Okay, all right, well good. Well, if you want to go deeper on this subject, Saturday at 10 at the hotel, um, Best Western Plus in Shillington, I'm gonna do four hours of this. So, four hours, and um, I highly recommend you come if you are on the fence or if you're against, if you have an open mind to the truth. So with that said, I want to jump into this. Um, this was going to be what we cover. Uh, oh, free pizza Saturday, so you definitely want to come for the free pizza. <laughs> I am going to be myth busting. I'm going to be destroying all the myths against an Article 5 convention at this, so it's going to be really good. Okay, John Dickinson at the federal convention said, experience must be our only guide. Reason may mislead us. Today I've changed that to experience must be our only guide. Fear is paralyzing us. I testify around the country for an Article 5 convention and I constantly hear legislators fearful of using the Constitution as the framers intended. And it's really a shame. Our country is going to hell. Nothing is going to change unless we, through our state legislatures, use the Constitution to fix the problem. And I am going to prove to you tonight that, number one, the Federal Convention of 1787 was not a runaway convention. We do not, I repeat, we do not have an illegal Constitution. Let's not dishonor the framers by saying they violated their commissions and exceeded their authority and I'm gonna prove that to you. My second proof I am going to show tonight is that the Article 5 convention is a limited convention and is not, I repeat, not a constitutional convention. So buckle up, get ready, this is what it's going to feel like. <laughs> Here we go. Okay, we have a very long, rich history of conventions in our, in our country. Rob Nadelson has done a great job collating many of these. This is how the colonies before our independence dealt with issues, and this is how the states after our independence and even after the adoption of the Constitution deals and has dealt with issues. These have all been limited conventions based on the subject matter, Indian negotiations, defense, price controls. Um, Obviously, we're going to be focusing on a couple tonight, um, but before I do, I want you to look at number 39. We had an official convention of the states called by the Arizona State Legislature to guess what? Propose, not propose, but to draft rules for an Article 5 convention. So if anybody tells you we don't have the rules for this, it's nonsense. We didn't need that convention because we had the rules prior to that, but now it's official. Now, also, you might hear that we don't have precedent for such a convention, that the only precedent we have is the Philadelphia Convention where they adopted a new, a new constitution. That is not true either, folks. In 1861, the country was heading to war. The states called, Virginia called an official convention 
to propose amendments to the U.S. Constitution. They met for three weeks in February of 1861. They drafted several amendments. Their plan was to prevent the war from breaking out. Because it wasn't called under Article 5 requiring two-thirds, they couldn't get it proposed out, so they gave that amendment to Congress. Former President John Tyler was the president of this convention. He walked over to Congress, gave it to them. They sat on it, and within a couple months, the war broke out, so it was a moot point. But we know the process works, okay? Don't let anyone tell you we've never done this before. In fact, the states meet officially every single year. It's called the National Conference of Commissioners on Uniform State Laws. They meet for one week, and this convention operates just like an Article 5 convention. The states appoint commissioners. It's a limited convention based on a predetermined subject matter. When they arrive, they produce their credentials, showing their powers. They vote one state, one vote, just like an Article 5 convention, and whatever they pass by a majority vote, they then bring it back to their legislatures to have their state legislature adopt as state law if they like it. This has, any of you heard of the Uniform Commercial Code? That has come from a convention of the states. In fact, Pennsylvania is looking at five of these acts right now. So do not listen to people that tell you we don't know how to do this. This started in 1892 because Congress was interfering with the states and, and the states said, uh, hey, feds, get out of our business. This is a state issue. We'll let the states decide how they want to create laws. And this body creates laws for financial laws, family laws, all kinds of stuff. And um, the process is vibrant today, all right? Now, when it comes to state constitutions, we have a long, rich history of proposing amendments for state constitutions. Every state has had a convention to adopt their own state constitution. They've had over 6,000 amendments proposed in these conventions. In fact, my neighbor, New Hampshire, I'm from Maine, New Hampshire leads the country, 17 conventions, two to adopt a new constitution, 15 to propose amendments. I believe they proposed 243 and they ratified like 150 or something. We know how to do this. In fact, I recommend reading some books that I've read here. It states that moreover, a number of conventions that were held in the latter part of the 20th century were limited in the topics that they were permitted to address. Tennessee has held five of these limited conventions. Um, North Carolina, the legislature sought to control constitutional change by strictly limiting the sorts of amendments that could be proposed by the Constitutional Convention. Again, this is a limited process. In fact, Pennsylvania, you have done it yourself. Your last convention, 1967, was a limited convention for subjects. They ended up uh, drafting seven proposals on those four subjects. And, the, and um, the convention faithfully observed the limitations placed upon it, okay? This is limited. This is what Article 5 is. It's limited based upon what the states apply for, and I'm going to prove that to you right now. Um, and, and those seven proposals were actually adopted by your state, apparently. So when people say, we don't know how the process works, we don't have the rules, it is nonsense. Let's use our God-given brains and some common sense. Now, before I get into the most important conventions here, the Annapolis Convention of 1786 and the Philadelphia Convention of 1787, I want to address some terms. Today we use the term constitutional convention and limited convention. That's not the way they spoke back then. Back then they described the powers of a convention based on whether it has full power and the word they used was plenty potentiary. That meant full powers. If it was limited or inferior, it was called subservient or subordinate. And this definition comes directly from Samuel Johnson's Dictionary of 1755. This is their terminology. So plenipotentiary is full power, okay? Subservient is limited. Virginia called the Annapolis Convention. Here is the power given to it. 
It was limited because it was a subservient and it only dealt with commerce issues to examine the relative situations and trade of the said states, to consider how far a system of government, uh, a uniform system in their, uh, in their commercial regulations may be necessary to their common interest and their permanent harmony. It was limited to commerce. Madison writing to James Monroe said this, the assembly here would refer nothing to Congress. They would have revolted equally against a plenipotentiary commission to their deputies for the convention. So they were only for a limited convention at this time. Madison to Jefferson wrote in uh, August, the states which have appointed deputies to Annapolis, Annapolis are, and then he lists them, many gentlemen both within and without Congress wish to make this meeting subservient to a plenipotentiary convention for amending the Confederation. Though my wishes are in favor of such an event, yet I despair so much of its accomplishment at the present crisis that I do not extend my views beyond a commercial reform. Madison only wanted a commercial convention at this point. The Annapolis Convention met September 11th, 1786. Only five states sent delegates. They realized we did not have enough representation to conduct business and they also amongst themselves realized we need to go back to our state legislatures and ask for expanded powers to call a plenipotentiary convention. And that's exactly what they did. They issued their report asking for this power for a convention in Philadelphia the next year to devise such further provisions as shall appear to them necessary to render the constitution of the federal government adequate to the exigencies of the union. No restrictions, whatever, that's full power. Now before I go further, I want us to understand the word revise, because this is gonna come up. What do they mean by revise? The term revise means to uh, review, to overlook, to consider over again, to re-examine. The example, we make a general review of the whole work. So a revision can revise the, can revise the entire document, okay? No restrictions whatsoever. Now, Virginia called the convention. It was not the Confederation Congress that called the Philadelphia Convention, it was Virginia. And these are the powers. This is the scope of the convention call. Convention proposed to be held in the city of Philadelphia in May next for the purpose of revising the federal convention. Revising mean full review. Revision of the federal system to all its defects. Further concessions and provisions as may be necessary devising and discussing all such alterations and further provisions as may be necessary to render the federal constitution adequate to the exigencies of the union. Not a single restriction. Full powers for our Philadelphia Convention. Madison wrote this to Jefferson after in December, just a few months later. The recommendation from the meeting at Annapolis of a plenipotentiary convention in Philadelphia in May next has been well received by the assembly here. John Mercer writing to Madison said this, the wiser part approved strongly of the convention in May. My last hopes have taken refuge there. They will, I believe, give almost unlimited powers. He was from Maryland, that's what they did. Here in a nutshell, in a snapshot, is what happened. September 11th, Annapolis issued, well, they, they convened and issued their report calling for a full convention, full power convention. Virginia calls that convention by sending out an invite to all the states with those powers referenced in their uh, call. And then four months later, in February, four months, Congress kind of felt left out as Congress always seems to be feeling. And what Congress did, now this is critical, under the Articles of Confederation, there is no provision allowing a convention to be called by Congress. Congress could not call such a convention. All Congress could do, and this is what they did, is endorsed the convention that was already called and they recommended it to take place. And in their, their opinion, it was not binding whatsoever, 
well, before I get there, if you notice, the Annapolis recommendation was, have, was to have the state legislatures confirm or ratify whatever came out of the convention. Virginia changed that and made it that the states, not the legislatures, would confirm, allowing for the people to adopt it through conventions. Because a constitution must be adopted by the people. That was one of the problems with the articles. It was an act of the legislatures. That is not how constitutions are to be given their authority. It must come from the people. And if you notice, in the opinion of Congress, here's what they wrote. For the sole and express purpose of revising, again, revising means full power, the Articles of Confederation, in reporting to Congress and the several state legislatures such alterations and provisions therein as when agreed to in Congress and confirmed by the states, not the legislatures, render the federal constitution adequate to the exigencies of government and the preservation of the union. This opinion endorsed the, the convention with full powers and gave uh, revised, again, full powers in allowing the people to ratify. So. Madison writes this to Jefferson afterwards. I think myself that it would be expedient in the first place to lay the foundation of the new system in such a ratification by the people themselves. They're already talking about a new system of government. Okay, that was the plan. They had full authority. Uh, in fact, read, I had handed out a sheet with all this information there. I ask you to please read Federalist 40. He, Madison, refutes the false claim that the convention exceeded its powers. He titled it, The Powers of the Convention to Form a Mixed Government Examined and Sustained. The convention was called to preserve the Union, not the Articles of Confederation. It was 100% legit, okay? Now, now that we proved that did not run away, let's take a look at the Article 5 Convention. We're going to go back to the convention in Philadelphia and see why it was placed in the Constitution. Now, Jefferson was not at the convention. He was in France at the time, but I love this quote. On every question of construction, let us carry ourselves back to the time when the Constitution was adopted. Recollect the spirit of the debates. And instead of trying what meaning may be squeezed out of the text or invented against it, conform to the probable one in which it was passed. Does that make sense? Do words have meaning? How many of you believe in the original meaning of the Constitution? That's it? Oh, that's all that believe in the original meaning of the Constitution? Hey, Sam, where's Sam? <laughs> all right, well, we might, you're going to have to come to my thing Saturday then. So, I'm an originalist. I believe in the original meaning of what they wrote. I believe in the original meaning of how the ratifiers, what they believe when they ratified it. So, here's my question to you, to all of us. Did the framers of the U.S. Constitution intend for an Article 5 convention to be limited to the subject or amendment agreed to by two-thirds of the states or an open convention or a constitutional convention? All right. How many believe it was a constitutional convention? Full power. How many believe it was limited? All right. Here, here we go. Let's see what the intent of the framers was. The first working day of the convention, May 29th, Governor Edmund Randolph stood up and introduced the Virginia plan. In that plan contained the first uh, amending provision of the convention, resolved that, the pr uh, that provision ought to be made for the amendment of the Articles of the Union whensoever it shall seem necessary, and that the assent of the national legislature ought not to be required thereto makes a lot of sense. They did not want to have to go to the Congress to amend the Constitution. Why do you think that is? Maybe it might get out of control. Maybe it might not respond to the people. <laughs> These guys were geniuses. That's what makes our Constitution so great is the checks and balances. That's the problem. The checks and balances are not being used today. This is the ultimate check against a runaway federal government, and I'm going to prove that to you. Now, this next guy is my hero, Charles Pinckney from South Carolina. This is the true father of our Constitution, because immediately after Edmund Randolph sat down, Mr. Pinckney stood up, and guess what he read? 
he read a complete constitution that he wrote and brought to him to the convention. I bet none of you knew that. In that convention, in that, I'm sorry, in that constitution is his amending provision, which reads, now pay attention. If two-thirds of the legislatures of the states apply for the same, <laughs> they have to apply for the same amendment. The legislature of the United States shall call a convention for the purpose of amending the Constitution. Or should Congress, with the consent of two-thirds of each house, propose to the states amendments to the same, the agreement of two-thirds of the legislatures of the states shall be sufficient to make the said amendments parts of the Constitution. They must apply for the same amendment. Now, this, at this point, this convention had not only the power to propose, but also to amend and ratify. If Congress proposed, then the states would have to ratify. We get to June 11th, and George Mason stood up as they're discussing the amending provision again. And he said, the plan now to be formed will certainly be defective, as the Confederation has been found on trial to be. Amendments, therefore, will be necessary, and it will be better to prov provide for them in an easy, regular, and constitutional way than to trust to chance and violence. It would be improper to require the consent of the national legislature because they may abuse their power. <laughs> Do you see the wisdom of the framers? We get to August 6th now. This is the first draft of the US Constitution reported out by the Committee of Detail. Contained in that is now the amending provision in, as read. On the application of the legislatures of two thirds of the states in the union for an amendment of this Constitution, the legislature of the United States shall call a convention for that purpose. Do you see, from day one, they knew they had to apply for a particular amendment. We get to September 10th now, near the end of the convention. Roger Sherman thought, hey, you know what? Congress should be allowed to propose amendments as well. And Hamilton agreed with him. So he made that motion. And then uh, James Wilson moved that three quarters of the states would need to uh, pr uh, ratify any amendments. They didn't vote on those motions because James Madison stood up and he offered this wording. I will not read it all, but I want to read the first part. The legislature of the United States, whenever two thirds of both houses shall deem necessary, or on the application of two thirds of the legislature of the several states shall propose amendments to this constitution. That was adopted, that language right there. We get to the very last day now of the convention and they are reviewing every single article before they vote on it, I mean, before they sign off on it. They get to Article 5, and I'm so glad George Mason, now he did not sign the Constitution, he became an anti-federalist, but I'm glad he stuck it out and didn't go home like the two boys from New York did. He stuck around, and he was like a thorn in their side, and thank God for that, because he stood up. He knew something was going on. The plan of amending the Constitution is exceptional and dangerous as the proposing of amendments is in both the modes to depend in the first immediately and in the second ultimately on Congress. No amendments of the proper kind would ever be obtained by the people if the government should become oppressive, <laughs> which I believe will be the case. They, he did not want Congress to even propose the amendment applied for. They don't trust Congress. They were bright guys. And that's where the convention was added back into the amending provision. Governor Morris and Elbridge Gerry made the motion, require a convention on application of two thirds of the states. And immediately after that passed unanimously without dissent, James Madison, he voted for it as well. He said, I got no problem with the convention, but I do not see why Congress would not be as much bound to propose amendments applied for by two-thirds of the states as to call a convention on the like application. That makes no sense if they were not applying for specific amendments. How could Congress propose something if it wasn't stated in the application? Do you see? Doesn't that make sense? Immediately after they approved that language, a motion was made by Roger Sherman to give Article 5 the power of a constitutional convention. 
Mr. Sherman moved to strike out of Article 5 after legislatures the words of three-fourths, and so after the word conventions, leaving, this is the words of Madison, leaving future conventions to act in this matter like the present convention according to circumstances. That unanimous consent is basically what gives, is a new compact. And they voted that down. No, this is not a, we're not giving this the power of what we're doing here today. Because unanimous consent, you only need that or use that when you're creating a new compact, not when you're altering a current compact. And two years later, Sherman said this, he's now in Congress. For by the present Constitution, we nor all the legislatures in the Union together do not possess the power of repealing it. All that is granted uh, us by the fifth article is that whenever we shall think it necessary, we may propose amendments to this Constitution. Not that we may propose to repeal the old and substitute a new one. It's clear, folks. They understood they could not introduce a new Constitution in an Article 5 convention. You've already read this. I just want you to, I just want to show how simple this is. Two-thirds is required for both. It, obviously, if two-thirds of Congress, they have to vote on the same amendment to have it proposed. So obviously, two-thirds of the states have to apply for the same amendment to have it proposed. What trips people up here is where it says, shall propose amendments in the plural. You notice how both Congress and the states, that language is there? For some reason, people think, oh, that mandates more than one amendment has to be proposed. It's just, it's looking down in the future, the corridors of time. A convention for proposing amendments. It, the only time more than one amendment has ever been proposed by Congress was the Bill of Rights. Every other amendment was a single amendment. If this is equal with the states, and it is, that means the states can introduce and propose a single amendment. And let me prove that to you. Oh, before I do, Article 5 does not have any rules for ratifying conventions. Did you know that? There's no rule. Oh, oh. There's no rules. Were they concerned about that? Of course not. They knew how to do, they did it all the time. In fact, 13 states ratified their constitution with conventions. Our 21st Amendment to repeal prohibition, 38 states called in 1933 conventions to ratify the amendments without any rules written in Article 5. Man, imagine that. <laughs> it's experience, people. What is our experience under our history? Okay? All right, Federalist Papers. I love the Federalist Papers. James Madison said this about uh, the, the amendment process, that useful alterations will be suggested by experience, could not but be fore foreseen. It more over equally enables the general and the state governments to originate the amendment of errors as they may be pointed out by the experience on one side or the other. Like perhaps the amendment of errors which would uh, get rid of career politicians, maybe term limits on Congress. There's a good amendment of errors right there. All right, let me explain to you now the difference because uh, Alexander Hamilton in Federalist 85 explains the difference between an Article 5 convention and a constitutional convention. The moment an alteration is made in the present plan, it becomes to the purpose of adoption a new one, and it must undergo a decision of each state. To its complete establishment throughout the Union, it will therefore require the concurrence of 13 states, unanimous consent. If, on the contrary, the Constitution proposed should once be ratified by all the states as it stands, alterations in it may at any time be effected by nine states. That's your two-thirds. Here, then, the chances are as 13 to 9 in favor of subsequent amendment rather than, the, uh, th rather than of the original adoption of an entire system. Every constitution for the United States must inevitably consist of a great variety of particulars in which 13 independent states are to be accommodated in their interests or opinions of interest in such a manner as to satisfy all the parties to the compact. It's a new compact. But every amendment to the Constitution, if once established, would be a single proposition. 
and might be brought forward singly, and consequently, whenever nine, that's your two-thirds, or rather ten, that's your three-quarters, call convention, ratify. Uh, or rather, ten states were what? Were united in the desire of a particular amendment. That amendment must infallibly take place. There can therefore be no comparison between the facility of effecting an amendment and that of establishing in the first instance a complete constitution. Enough said. It's a limited convention. One of the main purposes of the Article 5 convention is to stop the abuse of power in a, in a runaway federal government. Okay, that's one of them. We have amendments that have overturned Supreme Court decisions. Are there any dis court decisions you'd like to see overturned? We had one recently, didn't we? Um, Hamilton closed out the entire Federalist argument with number 85 referring to the Article 5 Convention. I'm not going to read all of this. He said, we may safely rely on the disposition of the state legislatures to erect barriers against the encroachments of the national authority. That is what the Convention is all about. If you think we have a runaway federal government, if you believe in the Constitution, if you want to do something about it, this is how we go about doing it. Okay, my time's running out. Oh, just to prove that, the preamble to the Bill of Rights, the, here's what the preamble says. The conventions of a number of the states having at the time of their adopting the Constitution expressed a desire in order to prevent misconstruction or abuse of its powers that further declaratory restrictive clauses should be added. Seven states, when they ratified the Constitution, submitted amendments that they wanted. Heck, New York submitted 33. New York wanted to do the whole thing over again, and they had an effort to try to make that happen. Um, here, let's go back. Could, wouldn't it be great if we can go back in time to see what these guys thought about on the very first Article 5 application? How did they interpret it? Well, let's do that. Virginia submitted the first application for the Bill of Rights. They didn't wait to after, and this was 1788 when they passed it. They weren't hoping that we just got to elect good people to go to Congress who will obey the Constitution. <laughs> they were smarter than that. Here, what's important about this, over 50 members of the first Congress were either framers at the convention in Philadelphia or they were delegates at their state ratifying conventions. Every single one of them explicitly stated, we can't do anything until two-thirds of the states submit similar applications for the same amendment or subject. It doesn't get any clearer than that. Um, now, what's interesting, Bland said, by the fifth article of the Constitution, Congress are obliged to order this convention when two-thirds apply for it, but how can these reasons be properly weighed? And they said, well, what if two-thirds don't apply for it? Maybe Congress should take it up. And that's what they did. Congress took up the Bill of Rights. Only two states applied for it, but it put the pressure on them to propose it. And they did five, six months after this. Did James Madison tremble at Article 5 convention? Have you ever heard of this? Okay. That's a quote taken out of context. He wrote a letter, and on my paper, I want you to read the context of this letter. He is responding to George Turberville, who's asked Madison, hey, what do you think about what New York's trying to do? Rewrite the whole thing with a revision convention. And he writes this. This letter destroys their argument that Article 5 is a constitutional convention. Because what he says, he lists the two different types of conventions in the very letter. He says, a convention cannot be called without the unanimous consent of the parties who are to be bound by it if first principles are to be recurred to. That's a new compact. A vote by the people, first principles, that's what he's referring to. Or, without the previous application of two-thirds of the state legislatures, if the forms of the Constitution are to be pursued, that's Article 5. The difficulties in either of these cases must evidently be uh, much greater than will attend the origination of amendments in Congress. Listen, he thought it should have been amended, right? During that period of time, the, the, the heat between the two parties, he, there's no, he said this in the letter, we, this, we won't get enough states to call unanimously to redo the whole thing. We couldn't even get two-thirds to agree on amendments. He said the simplest ways have Congress propose amendments. Read the letter, please. And um, 
Under section three of that letter is where that quote comes that he trembled. He was referring to he didn't want to go through the whole thing over again because nothing good would come out of it. In fact, if you read Federalist 38, he goes into great detail about this, and he says that they were looking to redo the whole thing, and that is what he's against, not Article 5. Okay, oh uh, boy, i got to blow through this real quick, guys, because I want... you got to come Saturday. Oh, nullification. I do want to address nullification real quick. Madison said this about nullification. On the other hand, what more dangerous than nullification or more evident than the progress it continues to make, either in its original shape or in the disguises it assumes? Nullification has the effect of putting powder under the Constitution and Union and a match in the hand of every party to blow them up at pleasure. Nullification is basically putting ourselves back under the Articles of Confederation where the states don't abide by anything. We want a more perfect union. We don't want to go back. We want to go forward making it better, not worse. At least I do. And I want to use the Constitution. Nullification is not a constitutional remedy. Let's first exhaust our constitutional remedies before we go to any other extremes. Doesn't that make sense? Oh, okay. I am going to end that, I guess. Last thing, Congress has introduced 12,000 amendments to the U.S. Constitution. 12,000, 55 this year. And many of these are great amendments. Um, the states have never introduced a single amendment under Article 5. And so it's time we wake up and use the authority that they've given us. So I want to thank you for your time, and I hope to see you Saturday. Come see me at the table when we're done here. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.